there, Ren Fair fans. It's time for another episode of Ren Talks. My name is Victoria Van Arnhem. I'm Olivia Harding. And I'm Nicole Skelly. And today we're joined by Amy Charlo, the hypnotist at the Colorado Renaissance Festival. Hi, Amy. Hi, ladies. Hi. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Hey. Thanks for being here. Um, so right before we got started, you were telling us a bit about your accreditations. Would you mind sharing them with the rest of us? Sure. Yes, absolutely. I am a certified consulting hypnotist with two different schools of hypnosis, one in the United States and um, Omni Hypnosis out of Switzerland. I am a certified hypnosis trainer in both of those schools. I'm internationally board certified. So I have a lot of accreditation here. So cool. That is pretty spectacular, <laughs> actually. Yes. Right. So we get to see you here at the Colorado Fair, and I know you've done uh, the Pittsburgh Festival as well. Are those the main fa run fairs that you do? Yes, those are the main fairs that I do. And then when I'm not doing festivals, I'm seeing clients one-on-one -on -one to um, help with their different challenges in their lives. Do you see clients locally, and do you see them online? Does hypnotism work on, like, on Zoom? That is a great question, and Yes, it does. And one of the great things we got out of the pandemic was a lot of really good research. Everything I do is science-based and a lot of peer-reviewed studies. Um, I'm a science girl. And we have great research that shows the mental health benefits of working with hypnosis or other forms of therapy via Zoom, just as effective as live as and in person. This is an wow. extreme side note, but I think it's very important for everybody to know. Uh, you say you're a science girl. Do you have the capability right now to stand up and show the dress that you're wearing? Yeah, yes, I think <laughs> I do. So it's got like a lot of dinosaurs going on. Yay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <It's so cool. laughs> because And dinosaur earrings because I'm going to, yeah, the Museum of uh, Natural History here in uh, in Denver. I, I actually used to be a artist on paleontological digs and I've designed a couple of dinosaur um, exhibits for a couple of different places in the United States. So I love dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> But back to hypnotism, I was trying to think, I can't think of any other sort of uh, thing that is an intersection of both uh, sort of mental health and medicine and entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mind talking a bit to that? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's fascinating. Um, I've considered part of my job. I'm you know I'm at the Renaissance Festival. I'm an entertainer, but if you watch my show, you see that I do. I keep sneaking in all of these like positive affirmations with my volunteers. I want them to feel really good. I want them to feel better when they get off the stage than they came onto the stage. I get. I, I feel like I'm an ambassador because the information I'm putting out about hypnosis is correct and there's so much mythology behind it and then it's re what's really interesting and, and sometimes kind of um I don't know if the word sad is quite right but it's it's important because I I'm you know in full renaissance garb at a festival and all of these people after every show come up to me and say can you help me with this I'm so stressed out I get kids like um like 10, 12 year olds, this is not their parents bringing them up. They come up, I'm so stressed out, can you help me? There is a huge need for mental health help in, in our country. And um, I'm really seeing it with the, with the young people right now too, especially. Um, so it's a very interesting intersection because you know, I, you know, and you can't really keep them separated completely. You know, I'm an entertainer, but I also really wanna help and heal. I, I see that a tiny bit, not to the degree that you do, um, but when I give advice and walk around and give advice, mm -hmm. it is, I thought it was just going to be all funny, haha -ha stuff, but people come up and they're like, how, how do I get through college? Uh, my kid died two years ago. I don't know how yes. to process that. Like, and, and it's nice to be able to give the, the people who are feeling that way, that, that sense of um, assurance that you're not going to be weird to them. And that they can come to you and ask, even if you can't help them in the moment or like you have to, for you, I assume like you'd have to be like, oh, if you, you know, contact me later and we can set something right. up potentially, but that they, they feel comfortable enough to ask people in vaguely Elizabethan dress in the middle mm -hmm. of the woods about that. Not only 
I think is like, I take very personally as like, oh, that's a good thing that they're, they feel comfortable. But at the same time, it's exactly what you just said, that there's a huge mental health crisis in the country right now, right now, the past, however long. And, um, it's a, it is a little bit like, oh, I wish you didn't have to come to someone random in the middle of the woods right, in a yeah. and dress to pour your heart out. But it's nice that they feel confident that, that you're not going to judge them or be strange or, or shoot right. them away or anything. Oh, I'm so glad that you're doing that. I, one of the most important things for people's mental health is to be seen. And even those tiny interactions, what we're doing is really, really helpful and really healing because they are being listened to and their experience respected. Totally. We've talked in the past about how Ren Fairs themselves, whether or not like we realize it or intend for this to be the case in certain parts of the country, they weigh heavily on people's mental health. That we learned this past year when certain festivals didn't happen, that people mm -hmm. were saying things like, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this year without Ren Fair. And you don't realize as like a performer where it's a job and it's a job, but it's a wonderful job going from place mm -hmm. to place that that is the case for a lot of these patrons. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've, I've had multiple people come up to me after shows, both in Scarborough and Colorado and saying, thank you for working with Digital Run Fair or the Renaissance Stream Guide because that's how I made it through the pandemic. So we've had an impact. Oh, Yay! absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> And it's so good for people to be able to go to a Ren Fair and just be their, their core imaginary selves, you know, just, you know, because that's who you really, you know, that could be really who you really are. It's like, you're not an accountant. No, you're a fairy ballerina. Why not? That's who right. your soul is. You know, go out there. You're not hurting anybody. You're just enjoying it and thinking outside the box. And, you know, on a scientific level, you're building new neural pathways. You're helping reframe the way you think about yourself. It's really good for people, you know? And then, and then plus, what a privilege it is for us to be able to share these amazing memories. Because really what they're out there is spending time with people they love. That's, yes. that's what they're doing. I just got all warm fuzzy. Yay. <laughs> um, I want to like tag on to uh, what we're talking about, uh, but a little bit kind of switch it. Um, Cause Amy, you had mentioned that there's like, there's stigma and mythology around hypnosis in the U S specifically. Mm -hmm. And so while we're providing that you're, you're providing this entertainment, but also mental health support and everything. Um, I don't know personally what the stigma and mythology around hypnosis is. So I, could you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. It's very interesting because um, the way hypnosis evolved in popularity in the United States is very different from the model that it evolved in in um, Europe. In Europe, all of the early posters will be like, would be at scientific symposiums and it would be like, you know, hypnosis demonstration, da, da 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 da. And in the United States, and it's a long story, but I'll make it short, it got uh, tied in with spiritualism and seances very, very quickly. And so in the United States, it took more of an entertainment route at first. And when I go over, um, I'm a speaker at in Switzerland, usually once a year at the, uh, the Hypnosa Congress. And over there, everybody uses the hypnotist at the dentist. Why wouldn't you? You know, it's, it's very accepted. It's very common culture. And now, especially we have all of the hard science. We've got, you know, all of the brain scans and it's like such a powerful healing tool. And the United States just hasn't caught up with this. I tell people I'm a hypnotist. They avert their eyes. They um, are, they'll say, Ooh, can you read my palm? And nothing against palm reading. It's awesome. It's fun, but it's not what I do. <laughs> and it's different in different parts of the country. I actually have to change my pre-talk that, that I do at the beginning of the show and just really demystify it. You know, it's science. I'm qualified. I'm trained. Um, you know, the, a lot of people don't know that the, the papacy, the cap, the Catholic church twice now has done two huge studies on hypnosis with all of their power and money. And at both times they, they said, this is a great process for healing. Use it. 
Wow. So Francis was just is just like, yes, women should be using hypnobirthing. It's fabulous. Wow. It just makes me want to know more about the history of hypnotism. Are there um, any books that you would recommend? I've actually been writing one about the history of women in hypnosis, um, which goes <sighs> way back. Because women have been, you know, natural healers um, have been using hypnotic processes forever. You can literally use the Hawaiian birthing songs that they sing while women are giving birth. It's literally a hypnotic induction. I could use it at the beginning of my show. It's fabulous. There are some really good books on the history of hypnosis out there, and there aren't a lot of them. But I'm curious because you said that in the U.S., like a lot of the hypnosis started with symposiums, which you might think are very similar to like the setup of Ren Fairs. But then I know there's all, all the extra bits of Ren Fairs, like like some idiots called Music the Gathering are playing one stage over and making a lot of noise while you're trying to do your hypnosis or there's like weather stuff. So what, what's that like bringing it to the Ren Fair world? Well, yes. When I first, I came from the corporate world to Renaissance festivals. They just hired me for one weekend because a friend of mine who was a hypnotist got sick. And I had no, I, I had done like some outside like fairs and stuff, but not where people are like, you know, hitting mallets and flinging frogs and like knocking each other off of horses and, you know, all of the crazy stuff that, that happens at a Renaissance festival. So there is a whole different setup and a set of challenges and what I've learned to do is really work with what's going on around me. So any sound that you hear other than the sound of my voice just relaxes you more, lets you know that you're safe. If you feel anyone on your left or on your right that reminds you that you're safe, relaxes you down even deeper. When it's really hot, hypnosis is actually incredibly effective at um, treating hot flashes. It's over 80% effective. And so you can use hypnosis for some physiological changes. So when it's hot, I am feeding in hints to cool down my volunteers and to cool down the audience. And I also use them on myself to keep me from like, especially with my older costume that was like all wool and six layers and full tutor. So yeah, there's a lot of different factors you have to really take in to be able, there are very few hypnotists that will take on a Ren fair. You, you've got to really be on the balls of your feet. And I think I've told you guys this before, you're actually doing two shows at once when you're doing hypnosis, because I need to be fully aware of the mental state and the depth of my volunteers. So I'm playing to them. I'm also playing to the audience. And so I do a lot of back and forth. And so I need to make sure the audience is engaged. I need to make sure my people that are, that are volunteered are engaged. So they stay in a hypnotic state and a nice, even one where they're feeling centered and feeling really good. So many moving pieces in my, my favorite weird thing that happened at a Renaissance festival that can only happen at a Renaissance festival. And there is no manual to set you up for this stuff as you ladies know. Um, I had a bunch of volunteers that were wearing those big, flowery garlands and this hummingbird comes up and he starts like trying to stick his beak into people's ears and I'm trying to like push him away and this is like the most determined little hummingbird I'm pushing him away and he's like me and I'm like me and he's like me I'm like and all the while I'm trying to keep the show going and you know not hurt the hummingbird you know you can't make this stuff up <laughs> that's fantastic it was hilarious Absolutely fantastic. of course the hailstorm what that came out of nowhere two years ago, like the really bad hailstorm. At that point, I had 15 people in hypnosis on the stage. And it's like, one, two, three, right awake, wide awake, save yourselves. <laughs> you <know. I'll> <laughs> <the bird>. <laughs> <laughs> as much as you are using those scientific methods of hypnosis and everything at a Renaissance festival in, in the guise of entertainment, do you do other events where it's entertainment focused using it, hypnosis as for entertainment or is is our fair is the only time that you kind of do the entertainment side of it there's a there's some overlap because i also do like corporate motivational speaking and um sometimes that involves demonstrations and like you know um you know hypnotizing somebody so they can't you know move a chair or something like that and these these things all make great metaphors um, I also just the last year started mixing hypnosis with art therapy, and I was working with high schoolers via Zoom in northern Minnesota, and so we would do a relaxation process, they would like draw and color, and we'd compare it before and after, and they would become much better artists 
because they were like in the moment and not judging themselves. So maybe that's kind of entertainment on top of it, at least educational, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I think fairs are probably, you know, I also do, you know, like corporate events and things like that. So, you know, done bar mitzvahs, <laughs> you know? done hypnosis at weddings. I have curiosity, wow. Victoria, Nicole, have you been under hypnosis? I have not. I have not. Me neither, all three of us. Yeah. Well, see, that's what you think. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my grandma used to use hypnosis to get root canals. She's highly susceptible mm -hmm. to um, to uh, anesthesia. She's a really little, really little lady, right? Like anesthesia will mm -hmm. basically like knock her out for a week kind of thing. And so she would, she learned how to do self-hypnosis and was able to actually bring herself to the point of being out enough to get serious maneuvers done Whoa. without that. Yeah. My, so my family's done it like self-hypnosis periodically before. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm familiar with it at all, but that's about it. Well, one of the first like studied uses of hypnosis was Dr. Dr. Braid, who was, um, who was assigned a prison in India during like the colonial era. And he, they didn't have any anesthesia for their, for their prisoners. And so he started using hypnosis and they were doing full amputations and da 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 da. And um, also it's been discovered that if you use hypnosis, we're getting it more and more accepted. You, you can either use no anesthesia or you can drop it down to like 25% of what you'd normally use. And then people have faster recovery. So, you know, it's um, incredibly useful tool that I really want to see get used more. And that's really it cool really that your family does it. And it does tend to, um, family members do tend to be good at hypnosis. If like, if the daughter's good at it, the mom tends to be good at it. I really love learning about all of this because you see hypnosis in an entertainment setting and then you know, or, you know, general public might see entertainment, uh, hypnosis in an entertainment setting, and then also know like, oh, hypnotherapy and stuff like that. Um, but I ne personally never realized like how wide of a range and how deep it could go, but mm -hmm. everything that you're saying about it, I'm like, well, obviously, how come I didn't think of that? Well, clearly you can use it for art therapy. Oh, obviously you can do it for mm -hmm. medical procedures. So it's so, so fun. Cause it's logical. Yes. I have a friend who in Italy who is a um, he does hypnosis in emergency rooms, especially burn units, because hypnosis is so effective for pain control. And they are finding that, I mean, he just they have him in the ER. He can like, you know, remove the pain and they and they don't go, they don't go in the shock and like their success rate and their survival rates of the people coming into the ER into the ER ER have just gone through the roof. You know, and that's just one hypnotist wandering around. Well, I mean, I'm sure he would appreciate my description of what he does. <laughs> just wandering around. Yeah, just wandering around like we do. How did you first get started in hypnotism? I got into it in a really strange and backwards way, which is how I do pretty much everything. I graduated with a degree and art in art, and then I had the brains to get a degree to fall back on, which is which was my theater degree. And um, that was a joke. <laughs> and I was working for an entertainment company. It's like, hi, I'm Amy, your birthday princess. And they kept getting requests for a female hypnotist because they only had a guy and, especially, and, and a lot of places were more comfortable having a female hypnotist. And they're like, do you want to learn? And I'm like, heck yeah. So my first training was actually on the road with like really old school hypnotists. I mean, almost almost vaudeville era guys. And then, you know, magically it works. And I have a crazy story about my first hypnosis show, but um, all my friends were like, help me lose weight, help me quit smoking. So I started doing that sort of hypnosis in my kitchen and it worked. And I'm like, dang, because I am a school, I am a uh, education girl. I need to go back and get all of my certifications and read everything. And, and, and so that's what I did. And the education is ongoing. As you know, I'm just finishing my master's to become a licensed professional clinical counselor. So I can start doing even, even more. And then I'm going on to the PhD. I love that from birthday princess to I, clinical counselor. I know, I know. Never underestimate those birthday princesses. <laughs> you said that um, they, they didn't have any female hypnotists. And it's true that on the on the circuit, I feel like you're the only female hypnotist. I've I am the met. 
There are very few hypnotists that will take on trying to do Ren Fairs because it's a difficult, difficult environment. And I'm the only female. In fact, wow. sometimes, especially the first year when I was walking around um, with my sign about, you know, the hypnosis shows, are, which I've now switched over to walking around with a spinny spiral, people would, would ask, oh, when is the hypnotist on? Like, where, what stage is he on? Like it happened all the, the time, assistant. and I'm, I'm like, no, I'm. I even thought about getting like a button that says, "No, I'm, I'm the hypnotist." <laughs> and, um, so that's really interesting, and you're also in a place that there are, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of, of course, there's a lot of guys at the Ren Fair, but being able in full costume to convince men that don't know me to come out of the audience and be willing to trust me enough to be hypnotized is quite an accomplishment because they, because of all the, the, the things around that, it's like, I'm giving up my power da, 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 and to be able to educate them. So it's really, I'm, I'm very proud that I can work in that environment. And I'm really proud to be uh, the only female hypnotist right now that's doing it. Also, uh, female hypnotists are very, we're still a major minority in stage hypnosis anyways, but we're the huge majority in hypnotherapy. Oh, isn't there something, I remember uh, reading something about female voices versus male voices in recorded things. Isn't mm -hmm. it something where one is used for facts and one is used for suggestions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like yeah, there's some of that. Why a female voice would in hypnotherapy would work better. Mm -hmm. Also, there's this really, and you gals are going to love this. You may have seen this study. I read studies, so you don't have to. Um, there's this wonderful study that in men's brains, they process a female voice in the same place they process music. Whoa. Female voices are music to men. Isn't that beautiful? That's lovely. Now I'm really curious about like genders and is it like a masculine brain or a specifically like testosterone filled brain that thinks that way? And if, for example, like a trans man would have exactly the same part of their, their, their his brain would light up. Now I want to like do even more studies. <laughs> oh, it's fascinating. And the beautiful thing now is like, we're getting better brain studies. I'm, 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 I'm not a neuroscientist, but I have friends that are, and I go to a lot of conventions. And so I see a lot of the latest stuff coming off the press. The Omni hypnosis that I do out of Switzerland, they're partnered with the Swiss Institute of Technology, and they have all these ongoing studies. And one of the coolest things that's just come out is that in hypnosis, you are not only really lighting up the middle brain, the front part of the brain that starts to slow down, and the middle brain, but it also really affects the limbic system, which makes it uniquely qualified to work with trauma and things like post-traumatic stress disorder, because you can actually change the way fight or flight is being activated with somebody. This is life changing for people. Do you want to talk about like the, what you do at the finales, like how your finales go with the jousting noodles? Oh my gosh, that is my favorite finale. I love it. The show has really evolved and changed since I've been doing festival. There are things that work at a corporate, you know, in close, as you know, mm -hmm. that don't fly at festivals. But um, so my for my finale of the show, I have started um, using pool noodles and having people reenact a joust. And inside Every human being is a seven-year-old that wants to do a dramatic spaghetti Western death. <laughs> Every human, we want to do it. And to keep them safe, I came up with the idea of doing it all in slow motion. And some of them will even talk in slow motion, which is hilarious. And they'll ride their pool noodle horses in slow motion, which I've intentionally made like look really pathetic, like they've got really ratty tails and stuff and it's just funny. And um, they'll do these incredibly dramatic slow motion deaths. I've had people like roll themselves slowly off the stage, lay in the sawdust and like, and like twitch. And then you ask them what their last words are, which 
can be anything which from, you know, I should have won till I'll be back. And my favorite one was a young woman who's like, you know, laying dead on the stage. And she's like, I wanted pizza. (laughs) (laughs) And the audience just died. It was great. (laughs) So it's it's fun. And it's good for people to be able to just, you know, let that out and have some fun. So I I know we're all thinking of it. here in Colorado, I know you have a very difficult stage maid who wears a green dress. Like, how is it working with her? Oh, man, she's a walking time bomb. <laughs> walking time bomb. I mean, we are just on eggshells. And, you know, and it's also really hard because, you know, between between the two of us with our large dresses, we, we, we take up a big footprint in the back of the stage. So it's kind of like one of those little games where, remember with the little plastic squares, we have to move around. So, yeah in the backstage so yeah yeah that backstage is narrow is, is. <laughs> <laughs> it is and it's got that big giant washing well wench bulk but tank show thing oh my god the, like, you have like, a tank in the back of your seat yes, no way. yes and it's yeah. not covered so you open the door and there is this gaping void oh <laughs> That's oh how my you break gosh. your hip. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But in all seriousness, uh, Nicole, you're awesome. You're awesome. And it's been I lovely try- having you backstage. And I enjoy you and your show. And you're just an addition. So thank you. I, I enjoy you too. I, it's It's been hard. Um, Victoria and Olivia, because all I want to do when Amy and I are backstage together is be like, Amy, tell me all about your stuff. What do you do? How'd you become a hypnotist? What is it like? What do you, like, I just want to like pepper her with questions and I have to be like, no, she's working. She just finished a show. She needs the same downtime that I need after a show. You need to leave her be over there and let her get some water. I just want to be like, Amy, tell me everything. <laughs> your, life, your life story start from the beginning and then we get you that would you and then tell me and re- can we read me a book and can you tell me what book to read and then can i talk to you about this other thing and what about the time that they did this thing? and what did this guy do it's just <laughs> get really excited. i thought yeah, of a ahead. really good hypnosis book i've got to get for you i've got a, i've got one i've got one <laughs> like All i low-key right. want to be amy when i grow up so. <laughs> <laughs> all want to be amy when we grow up i, I mean all right how could we not all right, we are gonna <laughs> gonna end the program there. Thank you so much for joining us again, Ren Fair fans. This has been another episode of Ren Talks, and we are your hosts. My name is Victoria Van Arnhem, and I perform as the Lady Victoria. And I'm Olivia Harding, and I perform with Music Gathering as Live the Druid. And I'm Nicole Skelly, and my show is the Gwendolyn Show. And we've been joined today by the lovely Amy Charlo, the stage and therapeutic hypnotist at the Colorado and Pittsburgh Renaissance Festivals. Thank you so much, ladies. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having me. Thank you.